Hi, my name is Alexandre Valencian. I'm a research engineer at CLT, a large research center located in the French Alps and focusing on semiconductors. My everyday life involves working on microelectronic circuits for deep learning applications, making use of cool new technology such as embedded non-volatile memories. But before specifying circuit architectures and doing circuit design, I had to understand what a deep learning application means, how a model is learned, what learning framework I used, etc. This all starts with correctly defining the problem to be solved and the necessary data. And guess what? This is the topic of this short video. First, you have to understand that deep learning means changing your own mindset. When developing an application, you will not write a rigid set of instructions, as in software programming. Code is usually much smaller. This is because deep learning models are not programmed, but built from data. You just do not know beforehand what features will be extracted from the data to obtain good classification accuracies. Say you want to spot a dog in an image and be able to tell what kind of dog it is. Is it a German Shepherd or a Poodle? If you wanted to explicitly program a software to do that, how would you go about it? Would you consider the length of the fur or the size of the ears? And how would you make it insensitive to the background, which contains detailed information? The same dog could be walking on the beach or standing in front of a mountain. These are the two very different images. Deep learning is really effective in that respect. It will extract information from minute details while ignoring large variations. Since you do not know what useful features deep learning will extract from the input data statistics, this means that you have to embrace uncertainty. This is the first change of mindset that you will have to perform. The second change is that you will have to experiment. Your models will only get better and better through trial and error. Maybe you will have to change the topology of your model or the optimizer. But most of all, since it's data-driven, you will have to enrich or correct your dataset. So, since you are an experimenter, you need to set up a scientific methodology. First, you have to define the problem. For example, my problem is the following. I want to sort out bananas from other fruits. Then you have to make assumptions. In my case, that would be I need to focus on the color, since bananas are yellow. Based on those assumptions, you collect data and build a dataset. Here I would build a database containing only the color of fruits. You can now train and verify your model to assess whether you made the good assumptions in the beginning. What happens if I train and verify my very simple model? I would find out that it wrongly classifies lemons as bananas, since my assumptions were too naive. If your results are not good enough or unsatisfactory like mine, just keep experimenting, refine your assumptions and retrain and verify your model. In my case, I would add shape information to my database of fruits, only to find out that my model now misses out green bananas. In the end, I would provide full images. This may seem like a very simple toy application, but these are exactly the steps that you will need to follow to succeed in developing a deep learning application. If you are not convinced, just ask yourself the following question. What data would I need to make recommendations on songs? Does the age of the listener matter or his past listening history? Your initial assumptions would definitely be wrong. Now that we've seen the global picture, I'm going to detail a bit more each of these steps. Remember, step one is define your problem. For that, you need to provide an answer to the following two questions. The first one is, what application do I target? Is it classification, being able to say, it's a dog or it's a cat? Is it clustering, for example, finding out that in images of vegetables, there are cucumbers on one side and tomatoes on the other? Or is it regression, like predicting the amount of pollen on a sunny day? The second question you have to answer is, what data do I need? If you are targeting supervised learning, then you need labeled data. If it's unsupervised, 
You do not need labels, but correctly defined data for ensuring great clustering, for example. If you're doing reinforcement learning, users need a virtual world and an agent, or a real agent, which is even more challenging. Once you have defined what kind of data you need, you need to collect and prepare them if no datasets are already available. Data collection and preparation is a foundation for trusted deep learning. This takes time, more than 50% of a project duration. This is because it's really important to ensure that data are clean, consistent and accurate. Clean data are data in which outliers have been removed. Outliers are data that lie at an abnormal distance from other values. These might be wrong data and you need to avoid learning from them. Clean data are also data that are sampled correctly. The training data distribution must reflect the actual environment. For instance, if you build a dataset for a self-driving car application, you must have images or videos not only of day driving conditions in good weather, but also of night driving conditions, driving in dense fog, etc. Finally, clean data are data in which bias has been removed. Since your models will learn from data, if they are biased, your model will be biased too. For example, say you want to automate the hiring process in your company by developing a tool to screen curriculum vitae. For that, you fill your model with all the CVs your company received in the past and with those that were given a positive answer. If in the past your company hired mostly male candidates for whatever reason, your model will learn that male candidates are to be preferred and there's nothing you can do about that. Also, data must be consistent. Inconsistency issues arise when you aggregate data from different sources. You might have inconsistencies in the manner that dates or addresses are written, or in the size of images or the sampling frequency of sounds. This must be obviously resolved. Finally, accurate data are better if you want your model to learn meaningful feature extractors. For that, you might need to do feature engineering on your own. Say, for example, that you want to analyze cell trends, providing raw dates like May 22nd or July 15th may not be accurate enough for extracting useful trends. But if you add the days of the week to your database, like Monday, Tuesday, it's an entirely different story. You might ask yourself, how much data is enough data? Well, there's no general answer to this question. A rule of thumb in deep learning says that you will need hundreds of thousands of data. If you do have much less data available, you will have to consider using non-machine learning methods first. For example, principal component analysis. A good method for determining the size of the dataset you need for solving a particular problem is to look at the learning curve. You can track the evolution of the training and test errors as you increase the size of your training set. The training error increases as you increase the size of your dataset because it becomes harder to fit a model that accounts for the increasing complexity of your training set. The test error decreases as you increase the size of your dataset because the model is able to generalize better from a larger amount of information. As you can see on the rightmost part of this plot, the two lines in the plot tend to reach an asymptote. Therefore, you will eventually reach a point in which increasing the size of your dataset will not have an impact on classification accuracy. This represents the maximum amount of data you need. If you do not have such a large amount of data at hand, data augmentation is frequently used to increase the size of a dataset. Data augmentation is all about generating new data from the existing ones with the same labels using all kinds of operations, from basic ones such as rescaling, flipping, normalization, affine, filtering, DFT, and so on and so forth, to advanced ones like elastic distortion, random slices, or labels extraction, or morphological reconstructions. Fortunately, most of the time, you will not need to build your own dataset, as there are many available nowadays. This all started with images, and especially handwritten digits. 
Useful for reading the amount of a catch's check or a postal code on a letter. This is the modified NIST database. Other databases are composed of natural images such as Cypher 10 and Cypher 100 with respectively 10 and 100 classes. Or the databases from Colsec. Today, the de facto standard for image classification is the ImageNet database, with thousands of classes and millions of images. But other databases contain 3D pictures as well, with different angles of view of the same object. You can also consider databases for facial recognition, a top trending application of deep learning, with databases of faces like UMD faces or Kezia web face, MS Celeb 1 million. Or emotions with Jack Fee, a Japanese and Caucasian facial emotions database, or face in action. But you can also find databases dedicated to speech recognition applications, or health and government data, question answering, and so on and so forth. There are so many of them that there are even search engines for finding a particular one, such as Kegel.com, which references more than 17,000 datasets. Once you have made your choice, or you have collected and labeled your own data, you will have to split the dataset into two parts, if you've not already done so. One part will be used for training, and the other part for testing. The ratio is usually 80%, 20%. The training dataset will be further split in two, the training dataset per se, and the validation dataset, which is used during training to check whether generalization from new data occurs or not. As long as the classification accuracy for the validation dataset remains low, the learning phase continues. Final validation is done with the test dataset. Wrapping up, if you have to remember just one message, it is that in supervised learning, it's the data that matters most. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please send us your comments and questions. This will be much appreciated. Bye.